Hey, what's happening? It's your man, Big Ticket. And September is National Suicide Prevention Awareness Month. And V103 wants you to help us silence the shame in Atlanta and nationwide. Mental health issues affect one in five adults in a given year. That's over 40 million Americans. Depression and suicidal thinking can happen to any of us. But until very recently, most people have kept quiet about the experience. Join the conversation, and together we can end the stigma of talking about mental health and bring more awareness in Atlanta and in our communities nationwide. Follow at Silence the Shame on Instagram and hashtag Silence the Shame across all social media. And be sure to follow the national I'm Listening campaign at I'm Listening underscore O-R-G on Twitter and Instagram using the hashtag I'm listening. Hello, my name is Shanti Das. I'm the founder of the Hip Hop Professional Foundation and the Silence the Shame movement. So I'm an Atlanta native, born and bred on the south side of Atlanta, Georgia. I'm grateful to be sharing my message in the community with Silence to Shame. Prior to starting the Hip Hop Professional Foundation, I did a lot of work in the Atlanta entertainment scene. Uh, I was head of marketing and promotions for La Face Records and got a chance to work with some of the artists that you may love from your hometown, such as Outkast and Usher and Goody Mob and TLC and Tony Braxton. And so I have been working in the entertainment industry for 25 years. And it's really great to be able to reach back into my Rolodex and help to amplify the message of emotional health and wellness so that we can all heal together. Greetings. My name is Vaughn Gay, licensed professional counselor, master addiction counselor, and certified anger management specialist. And I serve as the assistant director of counselor services at Morehouse School of Medicine. September is National Suicide Prevention Month. And right here in Georgia between 1996 and 2016, we saw an increase in suicide rates of up to 16%, with suicide being the 10th leading cause of death in the United States. For every one person that completes suicide, at least 25 people attempt. It's up to us as individuals and a community to pursue resources for those that are in need, such as the National Alliance on Mental Illness, the Mental Health Association of Georgia, and Silence the Shame. Silence the Shame was created to peel back the layers of shame and stigma as it relates to mental health. We want people to be comfortable with sharing if they're suffering from anxiety, depression, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia, suicidal ideation, or what have you. It doesn't matter. If you're suffering, we want you to get the help that you need. For those that have family, friends, or loved ones that have experienced any suicidal ideation, please contact the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 800-273-8255. Another great resource for those right here in the state of Georgia is the Georgia Crisis and Access Line. And you can contact them at 800-715-4225. September is National Suicide Awareness Month. And we're very excited about kicking off this campaign with Intercom and V103. It couldn't come at a more perfect time. We want to make sure that we're getting the message out of suicide prevention and awareness to the Atlanta community. And please don't forget to share your story at imlistening.org and on our Instagram at Silence the Shame. So Vaughn, you know, we just finished talking about September being National Suicide Awareness Month and how the Georgia rate has increased by 16% over the last two decades. Mm-hmm. What do you think we can attribute that to? So a lot of times we often talk about uh, what can be done about suicide. What can I do within the moment? How did I miss this? Mm -hmm. What we don't understand is that suicide goes along a spectrum of self-harming behaviors. And so we're looking at from the lower end of the spectrum, we're looking at self negative Mm -hmm. self-talk towards the middle. We have uh, self-injurious behaviors to where you may start to see some cutting Mm -hmm. or even some unhealthy sexual behaviors to where you're just trying to cause some some physical harm to yourself. But on the far right end is where we have the suicide complaint. All right, so we're looking at socioeconomic factors, things that we really don't attribute specifically to suicides. We're looking at single parent households. We're looking at unemployment rates. We're looking at substance abuse Mm -hmm. and self-medication. These things we often kind of overlook, but they are the foundational pieces of why individuals do Mm -hmm. uh, pursue suicide ideation and also completion. Mm -hmm. Roughly, we're looking at about 45,000 adults every year and upwards of about 40 children per year between the ages of 5 and 11 uh, Mm -hmm. complete suicide. Mm -hmm. And as we stated, 
stated, you know, for every person that attempts or every person that completes, we have roughly about 25 people that attempt. And so we have a public health crisis on our hands that is not being explored to the depths. We don't have enough research, we don't have evaluation of programs, and we don't have the funding in place to make sure that we have comprehensive suicide prevention programs. So that's why it's very important for organizations like Silence the Shame, NAMI, and other non-government, non non-profit organizations to start the, the mental health education process with this so that the rest of our communities and society at large can come on board. So Vaughn, the one thing that I always get from people that are either reaching out to Silence the Shame online or on social media is the signs and the symptoms. Right, you know, right. What can family members or, you know, classmates or peers, what can they look out for? Um, and how do they reach out to someone and ask them if they really do need help? Awesome. So what we do in the field, there is a model called the QPR model. Okay. Um, the letters QPR is an acronym that stands for Question, Persuade, and Refer. Okay. So if question and we want to make sure there are, there are two different approaches. You have a low-level approach and an intensive high-level approach. Mm -hmm. Low-level, you're kind of asking questions associated with, you know, just their demeanor and their affect. You know, have you been feeling well lately? You know, has there kind of been anything going on? You know, do you really want to kind of go out for lunch and it's kind of just chit-chat? Mm -hmm. And then we have those high-level questions where we're speaking more directly. You know, hey, I've been seeing that, you know, you haven't been coming to work, you haven't been going to school, you know. Mm -hmm. Are there specific things going on that you need help with? You know, if we know that someone has had some ideation in the past, we ask them if they have you know, have they ever attempted anything recently? And that's suicidal ideation. Absolutely, mm -hmm. absolutely. So those, so in terms of the, the Q, you want to question. The P stands for persuade. And so this is where it's very important because individuals such as yourself and I, we're considered gatekeepers into those, the, the, the lives of our loved ones. Mm -hmm. And so in order to persuade, we want to persuade them not only to be forthcoming with information, but we want to persuade them to pursue treatment. Yeah. Our responsibility to the, our loved ones is to make sure that we're with them throughout this entire process. And so it's not persuading them to do something they don't want to do. We have to be an active part in their treatment and recovery. So you're persuading them to be forthcoming, to talk about some of those deep-rooted issues. Mm -hmm. And then we're also persuading them, asking them if they're willing and eager to pursue treatment. Mm -hmm. The R stands for referral. And this is the last part before we get connected with a licensed mental health professional. We want to be able to, number one, as the gatekeeper, you have to understand that it's going to be up to you to find those resources for this person. If we leave it up to the person, they're not going to do it because if they would have in the first place, they already will be in a healthier place. Yeah. We want to make sure we find those resources and then we want to take it upon ourselves as the gatekeeper to contact these organizations or contact these professionals, set up a consultation and actually join our mm -hmm. friend or loved one during that consultation. What we want to do, we want to wrap our arms around them. Mm -hmm. We want to create a safety net and a, a structure mm -hmm. of support for them so that they know they're not going through this alone. By doing that, they can already start to internalize the fact that they have loved ones that are there for them mm -hmm. and we can start to eliminate some of those presenting problems. What about some of the specific signs? Like like say if you know school is back in right, right. and so you may have a friend or a classmate mm -hmm. or a family member like right. what can we look out for right so a couple things so before we go to the actual signs we have to identify some of the factors that may be in place okay uh, mental health of Georgia just released uh, an entire back to school kit for licensed professionals so that's really exciting for oh, us great. to be able to get that information out on social media sure. pamphlets uh, postcards etc okay. things that we really don't think about um, you know in the area that we're in right now deportation is very big especially mm -hmm. down here in the south you know so how are things like that affecting a young person. Mm -hmm. um, body image, right? You know, like it's the beginning of the year, and yep. we're dressed in a certain kind of yep. way and those who don't have the resources, right? Mm -hmm. You know, all these things are affecting us emotionally and mentally. And then we have to remember that our young people don't think in the way that adults think. Right. Their brains are still developing, their frontal lobes are still in the process of being able to regulate their emotions. Okay. And so by understanding those factors, we can now start to identify specific signs, right? Okay. So the telltale sign is that when someone withdraws from family, friends, or things that they really enjoy doing, that they're very passionate about sure. right um, when you lose that passion for things you love the absolute most then you're almost telling yourself that you really have nothing that's worth living for mm. right the second thing we want to look for you know is individuals starting to rationalize and negotiate their relationships with people right they're saying you know um, you know remember back a couple years ago when I said this that and the other you know I really apologize for that you know and I really hope it didn't affect you in that way and their affect and their demeanor may not be aligning with their behavioral profile over the years another telltale sign is if someone is giving their personal items away things that they really and truly cherish and love. Mm. You know, Shanti, I really want you to have this old 
relic that my father gave me 15 years ago from when he was, you know, you may say, well, that should be very important to you. No, right. I, I prefer you to have it as opposed to me. Mm -hmm. What they've already done, they've already contemplated and actually have created a plan within their minds, right, mm -hmm. of completing suicide. And so also we want to look at whether this person has a means of doing it, mm -hmm. if they have a plan, if they have an actual uh, an, an, an MO, mm -hmm. a modus of operandi. If they can actually verbalize those three things, the person's already completed, has, con has constructed a suicide uh, plan, and they are already in motion of bringing it to completion. So talk to us a little bit um, about some of the resources that exist. And, you know, a lot of times people ask me also, do I need to see a therapist versus mm -hmm. a psychiatrist? Okay. Do I need to be on medication? Right. And I know every case is different. Right, but right. What would you recommend? So, of course, we want to know exactly, you know, the terms of who it is that we need to get treatment from. Right. So a psychiatrist, a psychiatrist is a licensed medical doctor. And that's someone that prescribes uh, psychotropic medications to address mental illnesses, mental illnesses, behavioral emotions emotional illnesses and disorders. A psychologist is a PhD researcher or educator. This is someone that has a, a license, they're a licensed clinical psychologist, and they provide psychological evaluations, therapy, uh, treatment, and recovery. And then you have licensed professional counselors. Those are master level clinicians that can provide the same level of service that a licensed psychologist, clinical psychologist can okay. provide, you know, but they just haven't pursued the PhD degree. And so all three of these individuals are very important to the, the continuum of treatment mm -hmm. for individuals within the community. In terms of resources, you have a lot of a number of nonprofit organizations that are very prominent on social media, on Instagram, you know, on Twitter. And so we have to use the power of technology to really kind of access our resources. You mm -hmm. can essentially Google, you know, Atlanta, Georgia mental health professionals and you will get a Google search of those, right? Another thing, if you are insured, you can contact your insurance company the same way you look for a PCP or mm -hmm. an OB or a specialist. You can uh, look for licensed counselors or psychologists that are in your area by zip code. And you can search for those through um, the distance from where you live. And you can also get their contact information, websites, uh, do a little bit of your due diligence sure. on your end. But again, you know, that's very hard for someone that's going through, you know, a difficult time, especially mm -hmm. if they're, you know, in a phase where they're, um, you know, thinking about attempting suicide. Right. And that's why it's very important for us as, you know, loved ones to really kind of uh, access those resources and have them in a bank just in case that person's ready to take the first and step. And what about Grady right here right. in uh, Atlanta, in our hometown, the work mm -hmm. that Grady's doing? So Grady. It is a phenomenal job and a lot of our hospitals have a um, Department of Behavioral Health and mm -hmm. so um, there's something called a 1013 and all of our licensed clinicians know what a 1013 is and so to help the individuals in the community know so whenever you have a, a family member or a loved one that's in crisis in home mm -hmm. you can contact your local uh, law enforcement authorities uh, or officials and they understand what a code 1013 is okay that means that they have to actually escort this person to the nearest hospital that can provide psychiatric treatment on site so if I call 911 uh -huh. I I need to say, hey, there is someone here. This is a 1013. Right. They're having a, they're okay. having a mental health issue. Got we it. have a plan in place. That's really we know helpful. exactly where they want to go. We just need a police escort and we need a code blue or 1013. Okay. And the actual the police department should send out their uh, their law enforcement officers that have background and training in mental health. Which is CIT training. CIT, right? absolutely. Mm -hmm. So what does CIT training stand for? So it stands for crisis intervention training. Okay. And those are law enforcement officers that are especially trained to be able to look out for behavioral health symptoms or mental health symptoms that uh, may be uh, pervasive in someone's behavior that's not associated with them being physically violent with mm -hmm. their loved ones or a threat to the community at large. Got it. That's great information. So as you know, over the past few months, we've seen a lot in the news about high profile suicide cases right. with Anthony Bourdain, uh, Kate Spade, and then the accidental overdose with Demi Lovato. Um, what do you think it means for the public and our community? Um, when we see one high profile people, you know, taking their own lives because, you know, it's still so taboo. People think, right. oh, well, they're rich. What right. do they have to be sad right. and depressed about? So one, no one is immune to it. Mm -hmm. And then two, I want to just talk about how more celebrities, when they can come out and help and share how that can help everyday people to normalize the conversation around mental health as well as suicide awareness and prevention. Gotcha. Well, unfortunately, you know, uh, for those of us that are, you know, just in the community at large, the only kind of access we have to major celebrities are what we see on the television, right? right? You know, but we have no insight into what's going on in their personal lives. And to be completely honest, we don't even know them as people. Mm -hmm. And so we have this perception that, you know, they have the money, they have the access to wealth and the fame mm -hmm. and the fortune that, you know, they have everything together. Everything right. should be right on the surface but what ends up happening is that if you go and just have a five or ten minute talk with these individuals they'll be able to kind of tell you stories of strife 
depression, mm -hmm. anxiety, um, not feeling that they're not good enough, self-worth, self-value, because all of their value within their, their profession is associated with whether or not we, you know, are entertained by them, if we, you know, purchase their product, et cetera. And so we have a little bit of a false ideology of what it is to, to be a celebrity within our society. The pressure is so much, you know, for them to be able to perform and also to put up an actual front and a face. And so when they're out in the public, they can't be who they are, you know, as a person, they have to be who they are as a celebrity, right? Mm -hmm. And so uh, Rihanna can't be, you know, Robin Fancy. She has to be Rihanna every time she steps outside of the home. Right. But what happens if she's going through a bout of depression? What happens if she just doesn't want to speak with anyone? Then she's automatically labeled, you know, as someone mm -hmm. that, you know, is difficult to work with, yeah. you know, it's just, you know, so yeah. we, we have to understand that our ideology and perception of celebrity may not necessarily be a true reflection of who they are and what their lives are currently That's right. entailing. But and, and then on the flip side of that, the more celebrities open up and share, mm -hmm. I think the more everyday people will be okay right. with talking about it, right? Right, and that's why this movement is so important. You know, not just with Silas of Shame, but just the unveiling of mental health and what this means and how do we address mental illness. Mm -hmm. You know, we know that our society, we like to follow the trends of, of, right. of, of celebrities and athletes. And so we have individuals like DeMar DeRozan and Kevin Love mm -hmm. and, you know, a number of actors and actresses kind of coming out saying, hey, you know, I've Mariah battled Carey. with Mariah Carey just recently, yeah. right? You know, I've battled depression for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. You know, I've lost so many people in my family, you know, that I don't even know what it means to you know to develop healthy relationships sure. you know all these things you know so when we have individuals like that that are pulling the that are you know peeling back the layers of themselves right? right and allow themselves to be vulnerable in the national media mm -hmm. then what happens is as we continue to share this information on social media and just in conversations every day then we're really kind of creating a groundswell and so you're starting to hear terminology like wellness and self-care and mindfulness mm -hmm. and addressing your mental health. Uh, we start to see that across the spectrum in a number of different industries. So whether you're in business or medicine or entertainment or sports, mm -hmm. everyone is taking part in this. And that's yeah. how we're going to literally silence the shame and start to create positive health outcomes for everyone in different communities. Absolutely. You know, one of the ways that I deal with uh, my ongoing depression um, is self-care. Right. Um, so I make sure that I take a walk. Absolutely. I incorporate exercise Absolutely. because it's been proven scientifically that yes. if you exercise, you get your endorphins going, it puts mm -hmm. you in a better mood. Absolutely. Um, I love yoga. Right. Uh, you know, kickboxing, whatever it is, you have to find your thing, right? Absolutely. Meditation. Um, but self care is so important. Yes. Not just for people that are suffering through it, mm -hmm. but we want to uh, make sure that people have healthy self care regiments right. and put that into their daily practice and daily schedule mm -hmm. so that we can teach people healthy coping mechanisms. Yes and how to control those stressors in your not Absolutely. in your life so that hopefully you won't have any sort of suicidal ideation. Right. And so I, I actually recommend and suggest that everyone just kind of put pen to paper and create their own wellness plan yep, for themselves. Absolutely. And it has to do with more than just self-care because we also have to look at our nutrition, mm -hmm. right? Because what we put in our bodies, that actually absolutely. is going to generate an output, right? You know, if you have a, a diet full of high fructose corn syrup, saturated fat, things of that nature, your body's going to be very sluggish. Mm -hmm. Your demeanor is going to be a lot slower. It's going to have an impact on your brain directly. And they're now studies that are showing um, out in Europe right now that are showing the benefits of having a Mediterranean diet. So just having more, really? more vegetables and, and fish and yeah. fruit, you know, fresh fruit and water in your diet. Mm -hmm. And that's literally starting to decrease levels of reported depression. Oh, fantastic. Absolutely. Also, your sleep cycles are very important. So what happens is when you sleep, your brain is actually releasing a number of I mean, toxins. I need to sleep. I can't stay up all Absolutely. night and stay on Instagram right. checking everybody out. But what happens, we, we've created a sense of if you, you know, the less sleep you get, then the harder you're going, the more successful you'll be. But what's going to happen is that you're setting yourself up for crash and burn yeah. and failure. And also, you know, your brain can only do as much work as possible. Mm -hmm. And so even when you're going to sleep, if you have the television on, mm -hmm. your brain is still working. So you have to create some time for your body to get rest, sure. uh, more actual sleep. Then you have to create a plan for actual relaxation of where you're, you're awake, but then you're actually just not doing too much of anything. You're allowing your body to physically relax. Mm -hmm. There's a connection between your, your brain's health and your body's health. So mm -hmm. there's no separation between physical health and mental yes, health. I've been trying to tell people all the right. time, it's one, it's mind, body, soul. Absolutely. It's Absolutely. all one. And so again, you know, just being able to identify maybe a couple of self-coping mechanisms mm -hmm. for yourself. Mm -hmm. um, being truthful about, you know, the different traumas and challenges that you've been through. Have you addressed those or not? Mm -hmm. um, find someone that's a, a safe person that you can really truly confide in, right? Right. And say, hey, you know, I really need to just kind of have a conversation just to have a, a brain dump, you know, some emotional dump right now. And if you could just not be too judgmental and mm -hmm. just kind of let me know, it's really been some things that's kind of burning in me and I think it'll be really helpful. You'd be very surprised at how much the other person will say, me too. Yeah. Me too. That sigh of relief, right? 
Vaughn, thank you so much for sharing and, and, yeah, and providing all this wonderful information that we can take out into the community. We really appreciate you. Uh, it's no problem. It's been a pleasure, you know, and a true joy to be part of the Silence of Shame movement. And it's very important for us to continue to get the information out, mm -hmm. to be mental health educators and promoters of just general health education. Sure. It's uh, amazing for places like V103 to be a community partner. And I think it's really important for us to continue to get information out on social media because that's mm -hmm. where a lot of our people are drawn to right now. Everyone's on their phone. So yep. you can definitely check us out on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, any social media platform, uh, hashtag Silas the Shame. Get plenty of information that you can disseminate out to your own families and communities. And it's been a pleasure. I really enjoy um, working with you all and it's been a great time today. Thank you. Yes, I mean, and, and do your part. Let's get out into the community, share this message, take time, save a life, and silence the shame. Thank you so much for tuning in. I hope that you found the information that we share not only helpful, but that you will consider to take this information back into your communities, to your families, to your church groups and organizations. Take a minute, save a life, and help us to silence the shame.